Welcome all of you to this live program on Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Alam Arnaud from Paris, France. Dr. Arnaud is a consultant orthopedic surgeon specializing in the assessment and treatment of all hand and wrist disorders. She's been an active member of the prestigious Institute de la Main of Paris since 2017 and joined the International Wrist Center Project in 2019. She's a member of the French Hand and Orthopedic Societies. At the Institute de la Main International Wrist Center in Paris, she's currently involved in research, training, hand surgery fellows, participating in national and international meetings. Dr. Arnaud obtained her medical degree at the Cochin Port Royal and trained at the University of Lille in France, where she completed her surgical internship and residency in orthotics. She received specialized training in hand surgery at the Hand and Upper Limb Surgery Unit of Professor Fountain and the SOS Hand in Lille, Lesbian. Dr. Arnaud worked for six years in a public hospital as a senior consultant in orthopedic and upper limb surgery at the Orthopedic and Trauma Center Unit. She further specialized in wrist arthroscopy at the Institute de la Main of Paris, where she completed her hand fellowship under Professor Christophe Mathaud. In 2022, Dr. Arnaud created and launched the Wrist Journal Club, a nonprofit association whose aim is to promote and work on evidence based practice in wrist surgery and wrist arthroscopy. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Alam Arnaud from Paris, France. Over to you, Alam. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to Dr. Gopalan for the kind invitation to join this webinar series. So, uh, and to talk about the scapulonate instability management. Uh, it is uh, one of our, our favorite topic here in the International Risk Center uh, in Paris, in the Christophe Maitland Schools. Uh, so, um, I would like uh, first uh, to thank uh, my colleagues uh, and uh, friends uh, from Argentina, the young surgeon Gustavo Gomez and Ezekiel Seidenberg for kindly sharing their updating pictures, videos, uh, uh, and uh, last uh, research. So we will see during uh, this lecture that uh, despite uh, many research publications around scapulonate instability, uh, since the first descriptions, uh, the subject still controversial today, and there is no uh, current uh, optimal admitted uh, therapeutic option. So, uh, how it started? Uh, it started with uh, this uh, surgeon, with uh, the first description of the traumatic instability of the wrist, uh, with uh, the classic concept of scaphoninate ligament uh, with uh, an anterior, intermediate, and uh, uh, posterior parts uh, with uh, a dynamic uh, and uh, static uh, instability. Uh, with uh, uh, the main parameters of uh, the gap, uh, the DZ, and the scaphalinate angle. The first uh, attempt uh, to uh, manage the scaphalinate instability were first focused uh, on the only scaphalinate ligament. It were uh, open re uh, reductions, open repairs using strontious sutures or anchors. Here is uh, 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 the uh, example of uh, uh, an open repair using a uh, transverse uh, suture. Uh, here is another example of uh, a direct repair using uh, anchors. And uh, it appeared very early that uh, this kind of uh, uh, surgical techniques uh, uh, were not really efficient on scaffolding and instability management because it used a uh, large open approach. And uh, for example, the anchors were inserted in vascular compromised uh, areas and uh, ended in this, to this kind of disaster uh, that you can see here with a detachment and intraarticular migration of anchor sutures. Uh, the other uh, first attempts uh, were the open reconstruction techniques uh, uh, using tendons. Here are uh, the main uh, uh, example of uh, uh, the techniques that uh, were used. And uh, uh, these uh, techniques uh, targeted, uh, started to target the distal palmar components of the scaphoid stability, the STT, and the radioscaphocapitate ligaments. Here is uh, uh, the Brunelli and Brunelli technique. And uh, also, uh, dorsal capsulodesis were uh, described. Here is uh, the blood uh, capsulodesis. And um, as usually in scaphalinate uh, instability management, uh, those procedures uh, uh, appeared as difficult, uh, not really reliable, and the degree of uh, patient satisfaction was uh, disappointing. 
After this uh, uh, first uh, period, we uh, moved to what I call the classic era. And uh, uh, we started uh, uh, to uh, modify our philosophy around the scaffolinate uh, instability. Uh, the scaffolinate interitus ligament uh, was considered as uh, the primary stabilizer of the proximal carpal roll with a, a contribution to carpal proprioception. And it was first described with uh, three uh, uh, main portions the dorsal portion with the main biomechanical role, the volar portion with only bioelastic properties, and an intermediate part with no real biomechanical role. It, was, it is only a non-vascularized fibrocartilage that we can see here below. And here is the first traditional biomechanical pattern that the scaffolinate uh, uh, ligament lesions, especially the dorsal part, uh, non-treated uh, leads uh, to scaffolinate dissociation and finally to uh, dorsal intercalated segment instability, the DZ, and finally to the slack lesion, uh, the uh, radiocarp or the wrist arthritis. So uh, at this period, we started uh, to uh, stage the scaffolinate tears. Here is uh, uh, the example of uh, the Garcia Elias classification in uh, uh, six stages with an increased uh, uh, severity. And uh, these classifications were uh, focused uh, on the status of uh, uh, the ligament, uh, especially the dorsal ligament, uh, the alignment of the carpus, and the status of the cartilage. And uh, uh, also, the arthroscopy had a lot uh, in the classifications of uh, the scaphalinate tears. Here is uh, the glacier classification in four stages. It is an arthroscopic classification. Until today, it is widely used. We can see here uh, the view, the arthroscopic view in the mid-carpal joint. And uh, at this time, uh, many uh, new procedures uh, were described. Here is uh, uh, the, uh, one of the most uh, uh, popular procedures, the three ligament analysis techniques, uh, which aim was uh, uh, to replace uh, three uh, ligaments, uh, uh, the palmar uh, STT, scaphotrapezoid trapezial ligament, the dorsal scaphodinate ligament, and the dorsal radiotricheal ligament. Uh, this technique was uh, indicated uh, uh, to stabilize the scaphalinate in non-reparable scaphalinate tears, reducible when the, there is not uh, osteoarthritis. The, uh, the outcome that were published uh, about uh, the three LC uh, technique were quite good on the pain. And uh, uh, the, the outcome that were published uh, uh, showed no secondary surgery uh necessary after this technique so the the outcome were uh, quite satisfying after the three lc techniques uh, many modified uh, procedures uh, were uh, published and described one of uh, the most popular was the anti-pronation spiral tenodesis uh, published in 2012 and uh, the problem with the three LT techniques that was uh, many limitation appeared, especially uh, this technique was not uh, uh, possible when the lunate uh, is instable, when the cartilage was not normal, it was uh, not possible in uh, a heavy manual worker, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So other techniques uh, were described at uh, uh, this uh, period. Uh, for example, the Russell technique using a screw, a scaphalinate screw here, the bone ligament bone uh, of uh, quenod, uh, or uh, the Matulan technique, the dorsal ECRB ligamentoplasty. And uh, we started to have the first uh, treatment algorithm uh, according to the scaphalinate tears uh, classifications and severity. And all the techniques we've seen before were uh, indicated or uh, in uh, each stage for a tailored treatment, but according to the scaphalinate tear uh, status. So uh, this, uh, after this classic era, some uh, uh, questions uh, appeared uh, about uh, this tenno uh, uh, the use of this standard to replace uh, uh, the uh, ligaments. The first question was, it is reasonable to believe that the tendon will ever become a normal ligament. That was the first question. Will the tendon ever contain mechanoreceptors? 
And finally, will uh, this uh, uh, ligament uh, tendon be able uh, to resist to the biomechanical tensions and torques involved in this joint, which are specific to the wrist? So after uh, this second period, we moved to what I called the Enlightenment decade, which is, uh, in my opinion, the most important period, the period of the anatomist, uh, where uh, the role of the scapulinate complex uh, was highlighted and uh, the philosophy of the scapulinate instability uh, changed dramatically. And it appeared that maybe uh, the scapulinate uh, ligament itself is not the main stabilizer of the scapulinate joint, and uh, maybe the extrinsic ligaments that form, that compound the scapulinate complex, are the most important. So between all those elements, the DCSS, the dorsal capsule scapulinate septum, was first described by uh, this team in the aircad in Strasbourg, what is the DCSS? It was described as uh, uh, this anatomical structure between the dorsal capsule and the uh, dorsal scaphalinate ligaments. And it appealed. Here is a, a very nice arthroscopic view of uh, this uh, uh, DCSS, which is uh, here, this arch uh, uh, anatomical structure. It is a septum originating from the dorsal capsule and the ligament. The DCSS attached uh, the dorsal portion of the scaphalinate ligament here, the DIC, the dorsal intercarpal ligament uh, here, and the dorsal capsule. And it appeared that when the DCSS is transacted, it leads to scaphalinate joint instability. Moreover, the DCSS contains blood vessels and the most important proprioceptive receptors. So uh, it appeared that the DCSS is a was probably the originator of a pre-dynamic instability. So here are some examples around the DCSS. On the left, uh, an arthroscopic view with an intact scaphalinate ligament and a torn DCSS uh, here. Uh, this uh, is associated with the uh, um, scaphalinate instability on the arthroscopic view on the right here. Another nice example on the left, we can see an intact scaphalinate ligament with a positive push test. You'll see here with a prod, which is pushed in the mid-carpal joint. It is a torn DCSS, intact scaphalinate ligament associated with a scaphalinate instability in the mid-carpal joint. So with the DCSS, uh, some research highlighted the importance of the dorsal extrinsic ligament, especially uh, this, uh, uh, the research from LTID and uh, this uh, article with the uh, uh, sequential sectioning of uh, the extrinsic uh, uh, ligament. And it appeared that only with sectioning the insertion of the DIC, uh, DZ, an instability, and should. So, the section of at least one extrinsic stabilizers uh, uh, leads to a scaphalinate instability. So the scaphalinate complex is uh, that set of uh, extrinsic ligaments, the palmar extrinsic ligaments, the STT, the long radiolunate, short radiolunate, the radioscaphocapitate, and it appeared also that this ligament, the DIC, the dorsal intercarpal ligament, plays probably the main role in scaphalinate stabilization, especially its proximal uh, subsection. What is the DIC? It was described as a dorsal carpal bridge from the trichetrum to uh, the SCT joint here. And the, the DIC had attachment to the uh, lunate uh, uh, from 25 to 75 persons. And a section of the DIC from its lunate insertions leads to scaphalinate instability. More recently, very interesting uh, anatomical research confirmed this uh, uh, main role of uh, the DIC, especially, and especially its proximal subsection, the dorsal scapulino-trichetral ligament. And I would uh, like to thank here Ezekiel Zeidenberg uh, for sharing uh, this video and, uh, because it, uh, it is not yet published. So we can see uh, on the left uh, here the first video the only dorsal scaphalinate ligament is sections, and there is only a mid scaphalinate instability. In the middle here, 
we can see the DIST is transected, but not the dorsal scaphalunar tricuspid for ligaments. And we can see that there is an increased uh, worsening uh, scaphalinate uh, instability. And on the right, the third video, we can see there is a huge scaphalinate instability when the dorsal scaphalunar tricuspid for ligament is transected. So uh, those detection, these detections highlight the main role of the dorsal intercarpal ligament and especially its proximal subsection, the dorsal scaphalino tricuspid ligament. This uh, ligament has uh, attachment to the scaphoid, as you can see here, attachments to the lunate, and uh, it is integrated to the dorsal scaphalinate ligament, which is very important for the what we will see later. So to summarize. Uh, with uh, this uh, alignment decade, we, uh, we, it appeared that the dorsal extrinsic ligaments are very important. There is a prominent role of the dorsal radiocarpal anatomical structures, not only the dorsal scaphalinate ligament. And the DIC, especially the dorsal scaphotricate uh, for ligament, sorry, the DCSS, and why not the dorsal scaphalinate ligament, which is probably a secondary stabilizer. We have not to forget the importance of the FCR. This importance was uh, described uh, very early by Salvacol and Garcia Elias, with a role in distal stabilization uh, of the scaphoid. And uh, this uh, was described uh, uh, also uh, very recently with new uh, research. We have not to forget uh, uh, the musculoligamentous ref reflex proprioceptive loops with uh, especially uh, the research of uh, Haggard published in 2009. The DCSS has proprioceptive uh, receptors and uh, uh, there is uh, uh, the, the forearm muscle have uh, also a very important crucial role in scaphalinate stabilization. And there is also the importance of the interosseous nerve, especially the dorsal, the posterior interosseous nerve in this stabilization. From this, we end to a modern classification. The arthroscopic dynamic evaluation is now the gold standard. We use uh, the, mainly the AWAS classification, sometimes the Gessler classification. Uh, the uh, stage zero, the first stage, as uh, I uh, said before, is uh, probably a pre-dynamic uh, uh, stage, and uh, it is maybe associated with uh, dorsal ganglion. We are not sure. And after we have the AWAS 1 to 4, uh, and uh, finally the static AWAS 4 plus Gessler uh, 5 uh, stage. So what you've seen is that now the philosophy uh, about uh, scaphalinate manage uh, instability management change. We don't talk about anymore in 2023 about scaphalinate tears treatment, but it is important to call it scaphalinate instability treatment. And the rationale is that uh, we stabilize, stabilizing the scaphalinate joint is uh, stabilizing the scaphalinate complex with uh, and targeting the, mainly the DCSS, the dorsal part of the scaphalinate ligament, and the dorsal extrinsic ligament, especially the DIT. So now, uh, when uh, in 2023, how do we draw our evidence-based therapeutic algorithm? We have to answer some questions. We answered uh, uh, all of this question before. To summarize, are isolated lesion of the DCSS pre-unstable lesions? The answer is probably yes. So uh, for the, the modern, the current procedure, procedures, we will have uh, to uh, check if uh, the technique manage the DCSS. The second question, is the scaphalinate interstitial ligament useless? The answer is probably, but we don't really know for the dorsal part of the scaphalinate ligament. So we, we have to check if the procedures manage uh, the dorsal part of the scaphalinate ligament. The other question, what is the real place of the extrinsic ligaments? They are important, we've seen that before, but we know that the DIC and maybe the dorsal lunotracheal uh, uh, ligament is uh, the most important. So we will need to check uh, 
uh, if the procedures manage the dorsal extrinsic ligament, especially the DIC. Another question are, uh, does the distal volar ligamentous lesion exist? It is one of the, case, the question that is still controversial nowadays. Uh, we don't really know, uh, probably not, uh, but uh, uh, we don't have uh, an admitted answer for this. So some of the procedures that are described nowadays uh, take in account uh, the palmar uh, scapulonate ligament and palmar STT, but maybe it's not mandatory. And the last question, there is a real importance of proprioception. Do we act on proprioception with the arthroscopic repair? And the answer is yes. So for the current procedures, it will be important to have arthroscopic uh, procedures. The arthroscopic procedures maybe are uh, greater, uh, give, give a better outcome than the open one. So here is our specification needs for all the technique, the current technique we have in 2023. Uh, DCSS, DIC, dorsal intrinsic ligament, dorsal part of the scaphalunate ligament. We don't really know for the palmar scaphalunate ligament and the palmar SCT. And we will see that uh, the current arthroscopic techniques and the arthros especially the arthroscopic reconstruction techniques uh, lead to target uh, uh, those uh, elements nowadays. We uh, don't have uh, uh, a high level of evidence because uh, uh, the follow-up is not so uh, so big. Uh, it's not enough, sorry. Uh, but uh, the philosophy around uh, the uh, pro surgical procedure uh, recently changed. And we have also current open procedure and uh, we will see that right now. For the current open ligamentoplasty technique, uh, we can say a word about the ANAFAB technique. Uh, it is an open reconstruction and the EU, it uses an hybrid synthetic tape tendons uh, that passes uh, through the trapezium, scaphoid, uh, lunate, and radius. And uh, if we look at the techniques, uh, the techniques, it uh, uh, targets uh, uh, theoretically the dorsal part of the scaphoid ligament, the DCSS, the dorsal extrinsic ligament. Uh, the palmar uh, scaphalunate ligament and also uh, the palmar STT. It is uh, uh, theoretically a very good technique, very seducing, but the, it is an ex open technique uh, that uh, requires extensive dissections and the long-term outcome are not yet published. Now for the current arthroscopic reconstruction techniques, we have the PCO box reconstruction. It is an arthroscopic assisted reconstruction that uh, uh, reconstruct the volar and the dorsal part of the scaphalunate ligament. And it is interesting to see that in, uh, in this uh, ligamentoplasty, the volar and the dorsal capsule are included. So it targets, uh, this uh, technique targets the dorsal part of the scaphalunate ligament and the palmar part of the scaphalunate ligament, and also maybe the DCSS. So uh, 17 patients or uh, the series of 17 patients was published with an average follow-up of about uh, uh, 48 months. We have also the Corella technique. It is very interesting because it's uh, uh, the only technique that is uh, all arthroscopic reconstruction. It is not an arthroscopic assisted technique. Uh, the Corella technique, uh, uh, reconstruct the volar and the dorsal part of uh, uh, the scaphalunate ligaments, uh, uh, as we can see here, uh, but uh, the long-term outcome are not yet published. And uh, uh, theoretically, when we look at this technique, the, the uh, dorsal extrinsic ligaments, especially the DIC, are not taken in account. We have also very recently the We have also uh, very recently published the Smiley Future Button Technique that was uh, uh, described by uh, Dr. Bulent uh, Ozelik from uh, Istanbul. It is a very interesting technique that is uh, an arthroscopic assisted reconstruction. It uses a double suture button for the scaphalunate and the lunotriketral space here. And what is very interesting is that an arthroscopic dorsal capsule ligamentous repair that we'll see uh, uh, after is associated to this reconstruction. So when we look at the technique, the DCSS uh, is uh, reconstructed, the dorsal part of the scaphalunate ligament, and also theoretically the uh, dorsal extrinsic ligaments. 
but uh, the long-term outcomes are not yet published. So seducing technique, and we are looking for uh, the long-term uh, follow-up. And finally, uh, the Gomez technique. I would like here really to thank Gustavo Gomez uh, for sharing uh, his pictures and uh, also uh, his technique that will be published uh, uh, very soon. It is a very interesting technique, arthroscopic assistic te technique that uses an internal brace and there is no tendon grafts. So there are three options for the Gomez technique. The option A uh, is uh, uh, indicated uh, when there is a stable scaffold and stable donate. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, technique reconstructs the dorsal scaffoldinate ligament and also the DCSS, but also the palmar part of the scaffoldinate ligament. The second option is the option B. It is indicated when there is an unstable scaphoid. The option B reconstructs the dorsal part of the scaphoidinate ligament, the DCSS, the DIC, the palmar scaphoidinate ligament, and also the palmar STT. So it's very interesting. And finally, the option C is indicated when there is also an unstable lunate and a very advanced instability. This technique. Uh, uh, reconstructs so all the elements, the structures uh, that were reconstructed before, the dorsal part of the scaphoidinate ligament, the DCSS, the DIC, palmar part of the scaphoidinate ligament, the palmar SCT, but also the volar radiocarpal ligament, uh, as you can see here with this tunnel. So uh, the Gomez technique is very seducing because, uh, for example, the option C reconstructs all uh, the extrinsic and intrinsic ligament. It is an arthroscopic assisted technique with uh, 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 no extensive dissection. And uh, we can wonder if it's not the ultimate technique. Uh, 37 cases will be published with a minimal follow up of two years. Here is a nice outcome with a reduction of the dorsal scaphoid translation here and the uh, reduction uh, on the atros uh, atroscopic view of the scaphoidinate space. So uh, what we've seen before with uh, all this uh, arthroscopic uh, gamma-toplasty technique, reconstruction technique, they are very interesting because uh, we've seen that uh, all the philosophy and the, underst uh, the understanding of scaphoidinate instability uh, change. Uh, the problem of uh, with uh, all those techniques that uh, we have at the moment a very low uh, level of evidence uh, with a very few number of cases and uh, we need uh, uh, more follow-up and uh, larger uh, series uh, uh, to conclude. Now I will be talking about the arthroscopic dorsal capsule ligamentous repair. It is uh, the technique that uh, uh, was uh, uh, very early described by Christophe Matula, uh, we can see the, the, uh, that you can see here. And uh, since uh, its first description, uh, many uh, papers were published around the ADCLR. What is uh, the rationale of the ADCLR? It is the stabilization of the scaphoidinate joint by a capsule to ligament uh, suture. We apply it, uh, the ligament and the structure we want uh, uh, to heal. Uh, to uh, the capsule. And I will cite here uh, Christophe Matula about his technique. I will ask uh, uh, now uh, Christophe Matula, uh, uh, I will cite, sorry, Christophe Matula about uh, uh, the uh, rationale of uh, this technique. And he says it is a philosophical and metaphysical question. And uh, when you put a plate on a bone, which heals the bone, the plate or the bone itself, it is the same for the ligament. So here in this technique, uh, we can compare uh, the uh, cap. So in this technique, we can compare uh, the capsule to the plate and the ligament to the bone. So what about the ADCLR? Here is the original ADCLR, it's an outpatient surgery. Uh, with arthroscopy, as usually. The first step is a radiocarpal assessment uh, of the scaphoidinate uh, uh, ligament. We can see uh, usually the scaphoidinate ligament evolves from its scaphoid insertion, as you can see here. The next step is the push test, the evaluation of the DCSS. If the probe 
moves to the mid-carpal joint, the DCSS is considered a sore. And after there is the mid-carpal assessment using the MCU, the mid-carpal ulnar and the mid-carpal radial portal. And the, uh, the probe is used to dynamically test the scapulinate state to confirm the diagnosis and uh, to uh, stage the instability according to the Messina AWAS classification in a uh, fourth stage. At this moment, we choose either we use the original ADCLR or we use a modified ADCLR according to the stage. This is very important. So if we, uh, if we decide to use the original ADCLR, we perform this uh, simple suture with the scope in the 6R portal, as you can see here. We uh, visualize the exact uh, location of the suture, and we use two absorbable suture. The first suture is inserted through the 3-4 portal up to one millimeter for the capsule hole, and it is oblique from the dorsal to volar, proximal to distal. We use a second suture, which is inserted parallel to the first one into the ulnar ligament remnant, as you can see here. The uh, next step is uh, in uh, the mid-carpal joint. We retrieve uh, the sutures from uh, the mid-carpal joint. We tie the first node out of the joint. And after we perform, as you can see here, a proximal distal traction to place the nodes between the scaphoid and the lunate. And the, the final step is to uh, tie the knob in subcutaneous position here against the capsule. And when we look at uh, this technique, finally, it reconstructs the dorsal part of the scaphalunate ligament, the DCSS, of course, and uh, uh, not really the uh, dorsal extrinsic ligament, not really the DIC for the original ADCLR. Here is uh, just a short video of the summary of the technique for those who don't really know it. We start with a radiocarpal assessment. With the scope in the 6R portal. We assess and we confirm the, radio, the scaphalinate instability and tear. We insert the two sutures. After we retrieve the sutures from the mid-carpal joint, outside of the joint, We tie the nodes outside of the joint and we perform a proximal distal traction. Finally, we release the traction and we tie the subcutaneous proximal extraarticular nodes. After we have some modified techniques, as uh, uh, I, I said before, there is uh, the modified technique using anchors. When there is a bold scaphoid, we insert no remnant uh, of the ligament on the scaphoid uh, uh, side. We uh, insert the anchor through the tree for portal uh, in the proximal part of the scaphoid. And the end of the technique is the same. In this technique, we can construct the dorsal part of the scaphalinate ligament, the DCSS. There is also this technique using key wires. Uh, when there is a, a difficult uh, uh, step off at the scaphalinate space that is uh, not easily reducible, so uh, we insert uh, two scaphalinate uh, key, uh, parallel key wires and one scaphocapitate uh, pin. And uh, we uh, perform this reduction before tying the second knot of the original suture. We uh, reconstruct dorsal part of the scaphalinate ligament and the DCSS uh, in the, uh, this uh, technique. And finally, we have this large ADCLR. It was described by Christophe Matoulin in the, for the most uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, stages of scapulinate instability. Uh, this technique includes a large part of the capsule here, proximally and distally, and it increases uh, the constriction of the dorsal capsule. Uh, the needles are inserted to uh, two different points, and uh, uh, they are uh, directed in two divergent uh, uh, directions. And distally here, we can see two different entry points that are created in the capsule. And finally, we perform two extra capsular nodes. Uh, this technique is quite technical, uh, sorry, is technically demanding, and the learning curve is uh, required to perform it.
So when we look at the large ADCLR, we, uh, and at uh, this uh, uh, picture here on the left, uh, we reconstruct the dorsal part of the scaphoid ligament, the DCSS, of course, but also the dorsal extrinsic ligament and the DIC here. For the postoperative management, we immobilize the patient for uh, six weeks, eight weeks after key wire stabilization. And uh, the physiotherapy is focused on proprioception, uh, especially uh, the proprioception of the flexor carpi radialis. We see it is a dynamic stabilizer on the scape of the scaphoid. We avoid the stretching exercises in the first week. So uh, the outcome and the results of uh, the IDCLR were published many times. Uh, the functional uh, scores are quite good, and the outcome are good on the plane, the range of motion, and the strength. Uh, more than uh, I, I put uh, 600 cases, but now it's around 800 cases that were uh, published, uh, and uh, all patients returned to work after an average period of nine weeks. Uh, and uh, uh, all professional uh, level athletes in this first series uh, continue their sport activity at the same level. So I would like just to say a word about uh, the modified, modified technique, because uh, the latest research uh, uh, showed that the dorsal uh, scapulino-tricate for ligament ha had the, su the proximal subsection of uh, the DIC uh, has a, a crucial role in scapulinate uh, instability. So uh, this uh, DIC, sorry, implicator technique uh, uh, used two parallel uh, uh, divergent uh, suture and uh, their target, uh, the uh, dorsal scaphalinotricheteral ligament. And uh, this technique uh, uh, allows uh, a constriction and applicator of the DIC uh, and it reconstructs the dorsal part of the scapulinate ligament, the DCSS, and it targets mainly the DIC uh, at the part of the dorsal extrinsic ligament. So my first conclusion for our evidence-based diag diagnosis diagnostic algorithm in 2023. So the diagnosis of scapulinate instability is uh, made uh, on a, a set of uh, uh, some uh, uh, parameters. Uh, first, of course, the clinical assessment using the Watson test, the scaphoid shift uh, test, uh, the imaging, the advanced imaging, but uh, it is uh, admitted that the atroscopic dynamic evaluation is the gold standard to confirm the diagnostic, the diagnosis, sorry, and uh, to stage uh, the instability, it helps uh, uh, to uh, make uh, uh, in the, sur the surgical making decision intraoperatively, and uh, we use mainly the EWAS classification. So after this, uh, we highlighted the main role of the extrinsic ligaments, the uh, crucial role of the arthroscopy. We proposed in 2023 this arthroscopic tailor treatment. For the EWAS one, in the acute cases, it is the only cases uh, that are pre-dynamic and uh, in which we use uh, orthopedic uh, treatment with a simple immobilization with a cast uh, for six weeks. For the EWAS-2 and the EWAS-3 acute or chronic, if it is an uh, EWAS-2, A, B, and C, we uh, propose uh, the ADCLR, the simple technique. Uh, in the acute cases of uh, EWAS-2, we can use arthroscopic pinning. In the EWAS-3A and 3B, acute of chronic, uh, we uh, propose the ADCLR simple technique in all the cases. In the EWAS-3C, uh, acute or chronic, we've seen it is probably uh, complete scapulinate and DIC care we propose an arthroscopic treatment, either the large ADCLR or maybe in the future, the DIC picature ADCLR technique, but the results are not yet published. For the EWAS for acute or chronic, it is uh, according to what we've seen before, a complete scaphalinate, complete DIC, including the dorsal scaphalinal tricheteral ligament. And, uh, we propose uh, an arthroscopic treatment uh, here, the large ADCLR, maybe in the future, the DIC picature technique, and an arthroscopic reconstruction. It is indicated in these stages 
the, uh, the techniques uh, that uh, target the DIC and the DCSS and the scaffolding maybe Gomez technique or uh, Bulen technique, uh, the smiley uh, suture button technique. And finally, uh, in uh, the EWAS4 acute or chronic, it is the more advanced stages of scapulinate instability, acute or chronic. It is uh, associated with complete uh, scapulinate DIC, dorsal scapulinate, uh, scapulinotrichitral uh, tear, and other intrinsic uh, ligament tears. Here, either the large ADCLR or the DIC plicature techniques. It is interesting because these techniques are not uh, uh, that do, do not uh, burn the, the bridges for uh, all secondary uh, more invasive techniques if they don't um, uh, work. Or in first intention, we can use an arthroscopic or an open reconstruction, or we can use. Uh, salvage procedures, some of the surgeons use in this case, prefer to uh, use salvage procedures in uh, this case. So to conclude, uh, I just uh, uh, would, I would like just to ask one question. Uh, is there an ideal procedure that will be uh, able uh, to uh, describe in the future? In uh, my opinion, uh, the ideal procedure would be an arthroscopic procedure uh, that uh, target the DCSS, the dorsal part of the scaphalinate ligament, the dorsal extrinsic ligament, especially the DIC, and it is, it, it, it should be an arthroscopic technique. For the moment, this ideal technique uh, really doesn't exist. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, I will be able in one or two, or, or two years or three years uh, to uh, give again this lecture and to have another uh, answer. So uh, once again, thank you for the attention. Thank you for this kind uh, invitation to this uh, webinar. And uh, I am ready for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alam. Uh, thank you, Alam, for this uh, evidence-based presentation. And congratulations for the cutting-edge work that you do at Paris. Thank you. A <laughs> uh, few questions, Alam. Yes. Alam, uh, very commonly, we see a distal radius fracture which has a increased scaphalolunate gap, right? So yes. in a trauma situation, how do you address that? Once you, I mean, if you're fixing the distal radius, uh, First, how do you address uh, this yes. scaphalolunate? Uh, Actually, there is, no, there is no real consensus for uh, the acute cases of uh, uh, scaphalolunate uh, widening uh, that we uh, see. Uh, in the OR intraoperatively. So uh, the, what is admitted now, it is uh, uh, probably for uh, the stage uh, less than 3C, the mid scaphalinate instability that are traumatic. Uh, we don't do anything for scaphalinate, it will heal. We uh, stabilize the fracture and uh, we don't perform uh, scaphalinate stabilization. For the stage uh, uh, 3C, for us, for the stage 3C, we perform uh, the ADCLR I uh, presented and uh, we immobilize the patient for three, week, uh, three weeks, uh, uh, six weeks, sorry, uh, after. But for the uh, stage before, there is no level of evidence that showed uh, really that we should do anything for uh, the uh, mid stages of uh, scapulinate instability because. It is an acute and uh, the tissues uh, are bleeding and uh, we think there is there will be a natural uh, healing of uh, uh, the ligamentous uh, tears. Do you think you can just approximate the scaphoid and lunate and pin it with some form of K wires and allow the healing to be better? Do you think because the gap is reduced? Yes, for the uh, for the you 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 talk about the the uh, this fracture. Yeah, along with the yes, distal radius. Yes, if it, it is described. Increase. Why not? It is described. But uh, as I told you, uh, all the, 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 the series that are published uh, for the, uh, the less advanced scapulinated stability, the acute uh, stages, didn't show uh, any evidence. Because now we use, uh, we, we use uh, plates. There is no, no need uh, to uh, immobilize the patients uh, and uh, put uh, uh, key wires. 
but uh, some uh, it is one of the admitted uh, management uh, to uh, pin the scaffolinate uh, board. Thank you, Alam. Uh, Alam, just one more question from my side before I hand over to Lloyd. Uh, Alam, do you think all the spectrum of problems that you mentioned with the EVAS classification can be addressed completely by arthroscopy, wrist arthroscopy? Uh, we, uh, we hope because uh, uh, the question is uh, extensive dissection, uh, not only for the wrist, uh, the extensive dissection with uh, the, uh, they compromise uh, the vascularization. That is the first uh, thing. So uh, theoretically the outcome uh, we know the, globally uh, the outcome for scapulin and disability after any treatment are not so good. We have uh, the last uh, paper for Greg Bain that highlighted this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this fact. But uh, we try to uh, reduce the morbidity of uh, uh, the surgical technique. And the arthroscopy is uh, in the, the best, uh, the, the best uh, technique because we, we don't dissect uh, the tissues, less dissection, we don't compromise the vascularization. And the, on, the, the, the second uh, fact is that uh, we uh, maintain uh, the mechanoreceptor on uh, the uh, scaffolinate complex. That is very important. So I think the ideal procedure should be an arthroscopic procedure. That's why, uh, and I think now uh, most of the reconstruction techniques are arthroscopic techniques. That is the, the modern era. The surgeon uh, understood this, even if it's uh, technically demanding. Thank you, Alan, for that. Uh, before uh, I hand over to Loy, Loy, uh, please, uh, yeah, we also joined by Loyal Khatib is an orthopedic surgeon based in Dubai. Hello. Thanks, Ahlam. Thanks, Ahlam, for the Hello. comprehensive presentation. Hi. Thanks Thank again. you. How are you doing? I like your presentation, the videos you provided as well. Maybe one Thank of the questions is, I will stick to the principles again, is uh, repair versus reconstruction. When you do choose, do you go for repair or you go for reconstruction? The second question with this, whether a patient is right hand dominant or left hand dominant, let's say, the dominancy of the hand, would that affect the outcome of the surgery? Well, the last question is, is there any age limit for the intervention? Thank you for the question. For uh, the first question, do, do I go for a repair or a reconstruction? Actually, I am for, uh, from the ADCLR school. So uh, I don't know if you, you've seen that. Uh, I. Uh, uh, I pushed a little my lecture for the arthroscopic uh, repair. The fact is that what we say to our patients, uh, we do and we perform the arthroscopic repair, the arthroscopic dorsal scapulinate, uh, scapulinate uh, uh, arthroscopic dorsal capsular ligamentous repair. It doesn't cut any bridge for another procedure. You know, the ADCLR is uh, very simple. It's for very small uh, portal on the wrist, we don't uh, dissect the tissues, we don't aggress uh, the tissues, there are no bone tunnels, and we have a good outcome. We use modified technique when there is an advanced stage of ADCLR. Uh, the level of evidence for the ADCLR is not perfect, but it doesn't cut the bridges for another invasive uh, surgery. That is a fact. So, in first intention, I would choose, if it was my wrist, an ADCLR, I, I, uh, I, I wouldn't accept to have uh, bone tunnels for an uh, AWAS uh, 3B or something like this, because we have good outcome with uh, these uh, procedures. And uh, uh, if uh, I have to choose a reconstruction procedure in the second intention, I would go for, I, I would choose for myself, it is, if it was my wrist, uh, the Gomez technique is very seducing. The Gomez technique because we have three options. Uh, it is a tailored arthroscopic reconstruction technique. It is a, a arthroscopy assistic technique with no extensive dissection. Or why not? We are waiting for the long follow-up uh, outcome. Uh, the you know the smiley uh, the smiley technique with a suture button of uh, Ismail Zulen from Istanbul. Um, this technique is very seducing. And once again, for the arthroscopic reconstruction technique, 
uh, I, we feel that the level of evidence is uh, not uh, enough high. The follow-up is not enough and uh, the series are very small. So uh, as I told you, maybe in five years, uh, this, the same lecture will be totally different. And uh, you told me the age limit. Actually, uh, it is an arthroscopic teller treatment. So the first uh, stage, uh, the first step, sorry, is to assess arthroscopically the cartilage. And uh, uh, most of the time uh, for uh, uh, the patient, when the patients are, uh, uh, are not so, uh, are very young, uh, there are uh, no cartilage uh, lesions, cartilaginous lesions, and the quality of uh, the ligaments is quite good. So we, we are quite sure that the lesions are subacute or uh, chronic, but there was not uh, other, uh, other previous uh, trauma. So uh, for young people, we don't uh, ask any question, we go for the arthroscopy. For the patients uh, after, I would say 50, 60, 60 years old, um, most of the time when we have scapulinate instability, uh, we find uh, cartilage uh, lesions, cartilaginous lesions intraoperatively under arthroscopy, even if uh, the pre-op imagings are not uh, very precise about this. So uh, we enter in the wrist, we find that the quality of the ligament is not good, it's a chronic dissociation, and we have some uh, sign of uh, slack one, sometimes slack two, uh, in those cases, uh, we uh, we have uh, some other arthroscopic uh, uh, techniques that are not salvage procedures. Uh, these techniques are uh, arthroscopic interposition, for example. We uh, interpose uh, arthroscopically attendance. For these patients, when we are, when we are not sure pre uh, in the pre-op uh, assessment that it's uh, not a uh, subacute lesion, we need to uh, say to the, to the patient that maybe we will change our uh, technique uh, intraoperatively. That maybe we, will, we, we won't do intraoperatively the technique we decided before. There is a risk of uh, uh, cartilaginous uh, lesions intraoperatively. Loi? Do you have any other questions? Loi, I think, is busy with iftar. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, guys. So, 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 guys, for the background noise. Uh, no, that's it. Uh, thanks a lot. To, thanks again for the. I, I hope I, I, I answered the question. Yes, yeah, sure. For, oh, young, yeah. pe for young people, we are very reassured. For uh, older uh, patients, uh, we need to discuss before, but because uh, we have some surprise. Uh, it's if the, even if you ask for the MRI, the Arthro CT scan, you know, sometimes we have some surprise. So we, we, if we go for a, a surgery, uh, we need to be able to uh, to make the decision and to do another uh, another procedure uh, intraoperatively. Thank you. Thanks Alam. again, Ahlam. Thank you for. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Alam. That's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for this evidence-based presentation and i'm sure this is going to reach to a lot of people all over the world thank you so much <laughs> thank Alan, you for thank you for the invitation uh congratulations for this orthopedic principles webinar series i will follow you for uh, other topics and i hope to see you uh, very soon congratulations <laughs> thank, thank you think, Bye -bye. i think we need to give her a visit in paris goodbye like. <laughs> we should we should come to paris we should visit paris for sure Bye. yes you are uh, welcome Whenever you want, we have many visitors. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye -bye. Hey, oh.